As I said, we're going to be in um, John chapter 11 again. So um, I've talked about my mom before. And um, when I was 10, she and I started going uh, to church together. And, and actually, it was probably about a year before that, um, when I was about nine, we were going to church together. And when I was 10, I became a Christian. And she was just there to support me the entire time with that decision. She grew up a believer. Um, she gave her life to Jesus as well. And so she got involved. And she ended up getting remarried when I was uh, 10. Um, then around... Uh, that first year that she was married and that I had become a Christian, my grandfather passed away, her dad. And it really affected her. She had a very good relationship with her father. Um, and it was really, really difficult for her, especially just starting to go to church the way she was. Um, but she continued to go and she continued to believe and those kinds of things. But then when I was 13, the husband, the man that she was married to, had an affair, was unwilling to work things out with my mom, and left us to, to be with the other person. That devastated my mom. She became more angry about God. And it didn't help that some of the women in the church that used to be her friends were kind of talking about her. Instead of being supportive of her, instead of encouraging her, they were, you know, well, I don't know what they were saying. She never told me, but it really had a negative impact on her. Now, she still continued to encourage me. She still wanted me to, to go to youth group. She still wanted me to, to do all of that stuff. When I decided to become a minister, when I felt God was calling me to that, she was very supportive of that. Uh, the best piece of advice I got was from a woman who really at that time was struggling in her relationship with God, and she said to me, don't be a stuffy pastor. I'm sorry that I am not that way, that I am not a stuffy pastor. But that was the best piece of advice she gave me. And all the way through college, she continued to support me. And I would come home on weekends, and we would have discussions about some of the things I was learning in school. And, and she would listen respectfully, but then just would... Kind of when she was done talking about God, then we were done talking about God. And she was saying things to me like, I'm okay with where I'm going. At least I'll be with my friends. And that bothered me a great deal. And there was nothing I could do to change her mind because I was her son. I was Tommy, um, the kid that grew up making all kinds of mistakes. When I started dating Trisha, um, I would bring her home on weekends, and they would, and I would hear them discussing God. And she was more opening, open to listening to Trisha than she was to listen to me. Sometimes circumstances have a way of pulling us away from God and testing our true belief in who He is. We see that kind of happening here in John chapter eleven. Um, as I said, as I've said before, as I'm going through John, I feel like God really wants me to be deliberate and intentional. Um, I had one sermon prepared for John chapter 11, and as I was preparing that sermon for last week, God let me or it made me see something I hadn't really noticed before. And so I wrote down the idea really quickly and then continued to, to, to work on last week's sermon. And then this week, it, he just continued to, um, you know the word I'm looking for. Anyway, let's read John chapter 11. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Now what John is doing there is talking about something that actually is going to happen in chapter 12. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. 
When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. And last week I talked about this, that if he truly loved, G if he truly loved Lazarus, the next phrase should have been, so he went to Lazarus. But what we saw is that he says he loves Lazarus, but he stays two more days. And as you're going to see, there's a lot of disappointment in going on. So let's jump down to, um, let's jump down to verse uh, 11. After, after he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Then Jesus had been, speak, had been speaking about his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he, said, then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Jump down to verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them for the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Jesus, or Mary said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But now... But, that, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus asked, said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still in the place where Mary or Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come see, Lord, they replied, and Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take the stone away, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there for four days. And Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called for a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Do you truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God? What I hope to show you in this, in this passage is that what belief really is, what it, what it entails, because there is something going on in this passage that I don't know we really pay much attention to as we go through it. We're all enthralled by the raising of Lazarus, and that is the greatest miracle that happens in this particular passage. But there's something else that Jesus wants 
desperately for them to get. And it's something that he wants us to get as well. So the first thing we need to do is define faith. What is faith? Um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. This is from the New, Interna the New International Reader's Version. It says, faith is being sure of what we hope for. It is being sure of what we do not see. So faith then goes beyond a belief, a, a simple belief that God exists. There's something more to faith than, than just simply believing that God exists. And we see it here. I mean, it's being sure of what we hope for, and that's really easy. But what's really difficult for us sometimes is to hope or to be sure of what we cannot see. We base a lot of our belief on what we see and what we can taste and touch and feel, what, what all the senses are engaged in that moment. But faith, faith goes beyond that. Faith goes beyond what we can't see. When we don't understand the circumstances surrounding a, a, a difficult time. I mean, we, we see in this passage the disappointment that Mary and Martha feel, and even the people that are mourning with Mary and Martha, that all they, what they say about, if he had been here, you know, Lazarus wouldn't have died. So we see the disappointment. But our faith goes beyond what we see and what we understand. We don't always see what God has planned. We don't always see what God is doing. We don't always know exactly what's going on in our lives, why things happen the way they happen. What is it that God's trying to do? What is it that he's doing currently? And we can become discouraged by that. But faith moves beyond just the simple belief that God exists. It's about trust. Belief and trust equal faith. So when I put my belief in practice, yes, I believe that God exists. Yes, I believe that, that, that there is a God, so I put my trust in God. That's faith. Even when I don't understand what's going on. Even when I have a hard time accepting the circumstances that surround me, I continue to trust God because that's what faith is. There are a lot of people out there, ladies and gentlemen, who believe that God exists, but they don't live their lives that way. There are a lot of people out there who believe that God exists, but they don't put their trust in God to help them. They don't count on God. They don't pray to God. They don't worship God. They, there is no relationship there. It's so what we see at this tomb and what God has pointed out to me over the last couple of weeks is that there is a lack of faith there. Look at the number of times he says, verse 15, so that you may believe. Verse 26, he asks Martha, do you believe? In, in verse 42, so that they may believe. And in verse 45, there are people who do believe. So Jesus wants them to believe in who he is. To truly believe that he is the son of God. Now, the reason I say this is because of this word. Actually, there's three words, or four words in this passage that tell us that that Jesus is very concerned about our faith. First one is this one. He wept. Now the response of the people in verse 36 is, see how he loved him. And so they, they see his weeping as a man who's sad that his friend is gone. But is Jesus sad about Lazarus being gone? No. Do you know why I know that? Verse 12, or verse 13, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. Lazarus is asleep, we're gonna go wake him up. So Jesus is excited about going. Jesus understands the circumstances that are gonna bring him to that tomb and what he's gonna do when he gets there. Why would he be sad? about Lazarus being dead. Because he knows Lazarus isn't gonna stay that way. So what's he weeping about? 
A good clue to that is found in the, in the book of Luke. This is as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on, the, uh, on Palm Sunday. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would have understood or un would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes because you did not recognize it when God visited you. When was the last time any of us wept for those who didn't believe? And I think that's why Jesus is weeping at the tomb. All he sees around him are people crying. These are all people, well, we'll get to them. The other, phrase, the other three words that can be troubling is there in verse 33. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And then we see it again in verse 38. Once again, he was deeply moved. These, this phrase is an expression of anger. Why is Jesus angry? Because most of the people, if not all of them, who were gathered at Lazarus' tomb would have known who Jesus was. They would have heard his teachings. Most of them probably believed in who he was. And they would have been aware of his miracles. One in particular is Luke chapter 7. It's found in Luke chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 11 to 17. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As they approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the, the, the buyer. They were carrying him on, and the, and the bearer stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared to among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. So raising the dead had already been done. So here Mary and Martha are talking about the fact that he could have healed Lazarus if he'd have just shown up in time. And they're right about that. He could have. But he's frustrated because they don't believe that he can do more than that. He's troubled and angry because he sees them weeping as though they have no hope. It wasn't me that walked into that room. It was Jesus that walked in, into that area. It was Jesus who came in. And immediately their, their hearts should have been filled with, oh, we're going to see something really great. But that, that wasn't that way. They continued to mourn. And cry. And Jesus cried too, but he was crying because of the unbelief. Here's the thing that we know about, about this, is that God doesn't want us to suffer wrath. In, in the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, God didn't choose to, for us to receive his anger. He chose us to receive salvation because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. Jesus died for us. And some will be alive when he, comes, when he comes back. Others will be dead. Either way, we will live together with him. So we may not understand the circumstances behind what, why things happen the way they happen, but this life is temporary. That's why we hope for what we cannot see. 
That's why we look forward to something beyond this life, because Jesus is. As God is the I am, Jesus is. Jesus is the one who raises the dead. He tells, he tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha believes that he, her brother's going to live one day at the very end, but Jesus is very emphatic, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who dies who believes in me will, will, will be like they never died. It's temporary. John uses the phrase eternal life 37 times in his gospel. Now that may not seem significant to you, but the Paul wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament. He uses the phrase 33 times or 34 times. In, in all of the letters and all the books that he wrote, in the New Testament, he uses it 34 times. John uses it 37 times in one book. What does that tell you? It's important. It's an important thing that John wants us to get. And at the end, near the end of his gospel, he says, so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and that by believing you may have what? Life in his name. Everything about this life is temporary. And death is also temporary for those who believe in Jesus. And this belief has to go beyond the fact that, that, that he exists. It has to go into the trust of who he is. And that's the problem that he's struggling with here in this passage. It's why he's crying, because of their unbelief. It's their unbelief that brings them to tears. It's their, it's their unbelief and their lack of trust and faith in who he is and what he can do that brings him to anger and just frustration. It's like he's been with them. He's going to die in a few weeks. He's been with them for three years. He spent, the most, he spent a lot of time with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. As I told you last week, he spent most, most every time he came to Jerusalem, he probably stayed with them. I mean, you hear the sincerity of the love in the first part of this chapter. So we know that, that Jesus had deep feelings for them. And they obviously loved him. To open their home to him, they obviously were paying attention to what he said. But in this moment, in this moment, they are struggling with their belief. And you can almost hear the exasperation in his voice. Where have you laid him? <laughs> Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And he prays, and his prayer is more for their benefit. And he says that. God, I know you hear me. I'm just saying it for them because I want them to believe. In Romans, Paul says, One man sinned, and death ruled over all people because of his sin. What will happen is even more sure than this. Those who receive the rich supply of God's grace will rule with Christ. They have received God's gift and have been made right with him. And this will happen because of what one man, Jesus Christ, has done. Paul is telling us and reminding us again that death is temporary. That Satan's power is gone because of what Jesus did on the cross or, or through, the, through the tomb. Hebrews chapter 2 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. In order for us to get beyond our fear of death, we must trust that Jesus came up to life and that that life is meant for us because of God's grace, not because of the things that we do. Thank God for that. So 
So if I were to summarize faith, and this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, it's a trust in his ability to forgive. We trust in his ability to forgive. We trust in his grace. We trust that, that <laughs> there's nothing I can do to earn my salvation. There's nothing I can do to earn my way into heaven. And so I trust Jesus and what he did and his ability to forgive me, even if I can't forget. It means that we obey his words. Again, it's trusting that what he tells us to do, we should do. And we, and we have the right attitude for doing it. As I said, there are a lot of people, and even in this passage, who say they believe and who think they believe, but they aren't putting their faith truly in Jesus. They're not really trusting him. They're not living the way that they need to be living. Trusting him when circumstances look impossible. And that's exactly what's going on here. People are struggling with their faith because they don't understand what's going on. Why didn't Jesus show up? If Jesus had shown up, then my brother would not have died. If Jesus had shown up, he heals the blind for Pete's sake. He could have really healed. He could have healed Lazarus. But faith is trusting him in circumstances when they look impossible. And it's the realization that death is temporary. Trish and I were talking about, um, we can't remember the exact date, but my mom got married again soon after Alicia was born. Alicia was nine months old, and she had been living with a man, and, and they decided to get married. She said, it wasn't really she was convicted by God to do it. She just didn't, she wanted to set the right example for her first grandchild. So I went with that. I thought that was all right. Soon after that, a couple of years later, we're guessing about 1996, mom was diagnosed with MS. And her husband um, decided he didn't want to deal with that. So he divorced her. Now, soon after she was diagnosed with MS, she started praying again. And I thought that was odd because, you know, here, here she is. She's been through all of this stuff, and, and she rejected God in the middle of a circumstance. And now it's something that's, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, was a little worse for her. And that was what brought her back to God. So that may have contributed to her husband leaving her because he was not a Christian. But after he left her, I thought maybe she would go right back into disbelieving God again. But it, I don't, I, it was a God thing. She moved into an apartment in our hometown, and she started witnessing to every single, single mom that would listen to her. <laughs> I, it, wasn't un, it wasn't unlike her to to give them money, but at the same time, and she didn't have much anyway. She went, and I, I went to talk to her about that, but it was her money, so I let her do whatever she wanted. Um, plus, she was my mom, and she'd hurt me. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't unusual for her to give money, but then before giving it, she would give them a gospel message. So every single one of those people in that complex knew that my mom was a Christian. And when she passed away 14 years ago, as people filed through the line, many of those single moms came to the visitation. Story after story about mom and how she meant, how, and what she meant to them. Now I attribute Why'd you reach for that Kleenex? Now I'm going to go. <laughs> I attribute what my mom coming back to Jesus, not only because of the MS, but because of what Trisha was able to do in her life. To speak truth to her. And to help her to see her need for God. It was before we left for Connecticut, she had been, she had had, MS for about three years and had, it had progressed some. 
And, and we, set her, we took her to Monocles, which was her favorite place, and <laughs> tried to soften her up a little bit and told her that we were, you know, God wanted us to move to Connecticut. And I expected some pushback, but the first thing out of her mouth was, you got to do what God wants you to do. There's a woman who truly believed in the Son of God. She trusted God in her circumstance. She trusted God when she didn't understand what was going on. That's the kind of faith that I want. It's the kind of faith, quite frankly, that Jesus wants. Not just to say that we believe in God and who he is, but that we actually do believe it by the things that we do and the things that we say. That's how our faith needs to be, a true trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this passage in And that you weren't just concerned about raising someone from the dead, but that you were concerned about where our hearts are and our understanding of who you are and our understanding of what it means to believe. So Lord, I pray that we leave this place with a deeper understanding of faith. I pray, Father, for those who are struggling with it, that that they would remember all the things that you have done and all the things that you are capable of doing and put their trust completely in you even when they don't understand their circumstances. When we're faced with the impossible, God, I pray that we would turn to you, the God of the impossible. When we feel inadequate to do what you've called us to do, the job you placed in front of us, I pray that we will trust you and put our faith in your ability to work through us and in us. And Lord, I pray that our faith in you will grow exponentially so that others who see us may also believe. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. To help us to have faith in you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.